then I consider that the current president of the United States hasn't spoken to the president of Russia in two years. And I think back to that time in history, what's known as the Reagan reversal, where Reagan went from this incredible hawk to learning about nuclear weapons in, of all things, an ABC television movie called The Day After, having the crap scared out of him, and then realizing this is the president of the United States, realizing we cannot continue on this path. It is too dangerous. And that is why Reagan reached out to Gorbachev, and that's why we have the Reykjavik summit. It was called the Reagan reversal. So in other words, my point is Reagan, who, you know, the axis of evil speech, like this idea of seeing your enemy as the, as the arch evil villain, had to change for him when he understood nuclear war by seeing a film. And so when I look to today and I consider that the current president hasn't, isn't speaking to the president of Russia, it doesn't make any sense to someone like me. That's probably why I wrote this book. Like, please understand this. And I, one has to imagine that the current president, with all his decades in office, understands all of this. Mm. And so I don't fundamentally understand why there is no communication. It is way too dangerous. Hence your, the kind, what you just showed us, and you know, the facts will come in of whose weapon systems those are. But either way, the perception, to your point, the fact that the perception, a misperception, could ignite nuclear war, could ignite that situation that is unreversible, that should be astonishing to all of us. That's terrifying. Well, it's terrifying, but the one hopeful part of it would be, again, going back to the Reagan— the Reagan reversal, by the way, is the only glimmer of hope I ever found in all of this. Don't you think, though, that politics in general, and certainly world leadership, especially United States leadership, is much more compromised today than it was then? And a guy like Reagan doesn't really exist today. Mm. Tell me what you mean when you say compromised. I mean, the military defense contractors are making so much money, and they want to continue making so much money, and they have great influence over the politicians and over policy and over what gets done. Mm. And this money that they don't want to stop making is completely dependent upon the continuing to build right continuing to sell, continuing to, to, to have these weapons and future systems and more advanced systems and better systems. And there's so much money and momentum behind this that I don't know if there's a, a Reagan available now. I don't know if that's an option. If there's a person that can have some sense that can say that we are on a path to self-destruction and we need to stop and we need to reverse this path. You know, you're going to have people in, in the military, in the Defense Department, in, that are being influenced by these contractors. That was like, listen, 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 there's plenty of places we can move things around and get things done. And don't you know about these guys? These guys are bad guys. We need to get over there. We need to do something about this. We need to do something about that. And this escalation is motivated by the fact that they're making fucking ungodly amounts of money by making and selling these weapons. And this is a massive part of our economy. It's a massive part of the structure that runs the, the, the government itself. Absolutely. So then you have to ask yourself, what is also going to happen now that these big contracting organizations, Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed, are now being threatened by Silicon Valley, by the new defense contractors that are coming into the pipeline that are threatening their contracts because they can do it faster and cheaper. And so I fear that you will see even more of that entrenchment that you're talking about, even more of the, you know, the bureaucracy churning out more weapons and under the guise of Because they'll defense. have to ramp it up. Yeah, because there's a competition, you know, so, which is that double-edged sword because competition is what makes America great, right. I believe, in that true, you know. Yeah. But, um, but I, I do also think 
what's interesting is, like, someone I interviewed here in the book was Leon Panetta. So not only was he a former SECDEF, but he was former CIA chief, and he was former White House chief of staff under Clinton. And in our interview, I learned a lot from him about those three kind of elements of the national security, advising the president, you know, being SECDEF, being in charge of all of this, and uh, being CIA chief the, from the intelligence point of view. But what was even more interesting about interviewing Panetta was that he said to me at the end of our interview, it's good that you're doing this. The American people need to know. That's a direct quote from him. So here's a guy who has spent his entire life entrenched in that system that you're talking about. And then outside of it, once he retires, puts on his, shall we say, grandfather's hat, the human hat, and is suddenly like, this is really going in the wrong direction. I would hope that that would lead to more people thinking wisely about what it is they're doing when they're in office as far as nuclear war is concerned.